Thanks for watching this week. Speaking of thanks, I know this is the week of Thanksgiving. I'm recording this on the Monday before Thanksgiving. I know many of you will be watching this after Thanksgiving. Just remember to uh, remind your class this week, as we studied last week in 1 Thessalonians 5, to give thanks always. I know we emphasize thanks this week, but give thanks always in all circumstances. Hey, now for this next quarter, starting December 1st, uh, we're going to be studying two very heavy theological terms, apologetics and theodicy. Now, the second unit, which starts in, on January 12th, it'll, be, it'll go for seven weeks, and that will be the study on theodicy, which is a theological response to why evil and suffering exists. But our current, our new unit uh, that, that starts this week will be for six weeks, and it's going to be looking at apologetics, specifically Christian apologetics. Now, apologetics has nothing to do with what we think of, of apologizing. Apologetics is simply defending the faith. All right, so this is our new unit. It's entitled Answers to Tough Questions, Defending What You Believe. This is our first lesson. It's called, Do We Need to Defend Our Faith? The scripture is out of the book of Jude, verses 1 through 4 and 20 through 25. And the point of this lesson is God can use you to show others the truth. Now, before we get into the lesson, I think the best books on apologetics are those who are written by Christians who were former atheists. And I think of people like Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel. Uh, these men set out to dispute Christianity, but they found that the proof for Christianity, uh, not only for the existence of God, but that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the Bible is trustworthy, all these things, they found that proof to be overwhelming. And so now they themselves are believers who strongly defend the Christian faith. So check out those two authors, and there are others as well. Now, when it comes to defending the faith, some may say, well, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. You may have even seen that bumper sticker. But here's the problem with that logic. You can use that same statement, that same logic, and apply it to the Book of Mormon, to the Quran, to any other religious or even non-religious text. You may have heard other people say things like, well, I didn't need anybody to prove to me the existence of God. I was convicted by the Holy Spirit under the preaching of the Word. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. But, you know, just like people have different personalities and Christians in a church have different spiritual gifts that make up that, that church, could it be that some people come to faith in Christ differently in various ways? Some through just the preaching of the Word. Some maybe through some logical research and reasoning like Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell. Or maybe in just seeing how somebody's life was changed and that affected them. Think about what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23. He said, I have become all things to all people that I might, that I might win some. See, there's not a cookie-cutter strategy uh, when it comes to gospel presentation. Or even think of this, even to the success of a Sunday school class. You know, some prefer larger classes, but some like that intimacy of the smaller class. Some learn better with a lot of interaction between the people, and others prefer that lecture. So see, people are just wired differently. All right, let's look on into the text this week. What do we, what do we have? We're in Jude. Jude is a, one of the shortest books in the Bible, only one chapter. And so we just refer to the verses. So in Jude, verses 1 and 2, just a typical introduction of a first century letter. Okay, your leader's guide has some more information about uh, some specifics on that if you want to look at that. Also, then we get on down to Jude, uh, verses 3 and 4. See, Jude wanted to write a letter discussing the wonders of, uh, wonders of salvation, but it had come to his attention that there was a problem that needed to be immediately addressed. And this problem is listed down in verse 4. And what is that? Well, there were some ungodly people that had infiltrated themselves among the believers. And they perverted the gospel, uh, the message of, of God's grace. They've turned that into a license to sin. And they even denied Jesus, either by their words. Now, re remember last month, our study in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, uh, we mentioned that a spirit-enabled person would never say, Jesus is accursed. Okay, so it could, could be that they were denying Jesus like that. Or they could have been denying Jesus just by their actions, by the hypocrisy, by saying one thing, uh, acting another. And this is what Craig Groeschel calls 
uh, talks about in his book, The Christian Atheist. Yeah. Now, it could be that Jude is addressing uh, the beliefs of the Gnostics, and Paul also addressed this heresy in, in Colossians and in 1 Timothy as well. Now, here are some beliefs about Gnosticism. One is that knowledge is the key to salvation. And, of course, they themselves, the Gnostics, held that knowledge. They were keepers of that knowledge. They also thought that flesh was evil. All matter was evil. And so they denied then that Jesus actually came in the flesh because the flesh is evil. And so he just had that appearance of a man. Also, they believe that God is very distant, uh, that he's not involved in creation. Uh, he's far removed from humans. Um, so, so their Gnosticism there could be taken to one of two extremes because of that flesh is evil. They could say, well, all matter is evil, all flesh is evil, so it doesn't matter what I do. Sexual immorality, get drunk, uh, whatever I say, it doesn't matter. I can't improve on my condition. Therefore, I'm just going to do whatever I want to. And Paul addressed this uh, elsewhere, like in Romans chapter 6, talking about the Libertines, where they said, um, uh, that was their, their thought, was that I can just do whatever I want to, and because God's grace is so great, his grace abounds even more. But how did Paul answer that? He said, what shall we say then? Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means, or the King James says, God forbid. So, that's one way they could look at uh, that all flesh is evil. Or the other way is that since all matter is evil, all flesh is evil, I have to deny myself every pleasure known. You know, you've got the people who beat themselves, uh, deny themselves of everything, this asceticism type of lifestyle. Well, it's this heresy, whether it's Gnosticism or something else, that was the problem. And so what were the recipients of Jude's letter supposed to do? They were supposed to, in verse 3, it says, contend for the faith. And contend, is it's this Greek word, it's only used once here in the New Testament. It's used elsewhere to describe uh, the struggle in an athletic contest. And, and we use that word today, don't we? The English word when we're talking about boxers uh, contending uh, in the ring. Now, Christi so here's the thing. Christianity isn't just about love and acceptance. It needs to be confrontational sometimes, and it can be. Uh, remember last week we talked about all Christians are called to admonish when needed, and admonish means to, to call out, to correct. But remember what we talked about also, we have to do so lovingly and with mercy, as we'll see a little bit later. So how do these people with this heresy, how do they get into the church? Well, it says right there in the text, they slipped in, they crept in, and that's how most sin enters, either a church or in a person's life, isn't it? Now, I don't believe that coffee nor uh, spicy foods are sinful in and of themselves, but I think that the way I enjoy them now, I believe this illustrates this very well. Like, when I first started drinking coffee as uh, early in college, it was probably half coffee, half sugar, and half cream, okay? <laughs> Three halves. And, and so as, as I developed that taste for coffee, the cream and sugar got less and less and less. And so now I just drink black coffee and I like it bold, black and bold. That's the way I like my coffee. Now, I couldn't have tolerated that 30, 40 years ago. But over time, I got used to it. And it's kind of the same thing with, with spicy foods. Uh, back Way back then, couldn't stand the spice. I'd add a little bit more, a little bit more. Now I like spicy foods. What I didn't used to be able to tolerate, I now enjoy. Okay, That's the same way it's, that sin can creep in, heresy can creep into a person's life or into a church just a little bit at a time. Now verses 5 through 19 aren't in our lesson text, but a lot of detail there about the ungodly folks that are mentioned in verse 4. So the book's so short, go ahead and read that before you go to class. You may even want to read it in class just to give a little more background there. All right, so we go on down to verse 20, and he says, But you, dear friends, okay, so he's contrasting uh, his, his Christian brothers and sisters with, he's contra contrasting them uh, with the ungodly people. Here's all the things about the ungodly people, but you, dear friends, do these things. So be proactive in your faith, and the best, the best way to minimize the influence of the negative is to strengthen the positive. To prevent decay, you have to grow. So how do you do that? Well, 
Jude mentions a couple of things here. He says, build yourself up in the faith. Well, see, salvation, that's God's work. But discipleship, growing in the faith, that's up to us. We have, it's up to us to learn the truths of the doctrine and, and not be fooled by heresy. All right. It also tells us to pray in the Holy Spirit, to pray in harmony with the Spirit. Not, not on our own agenda, but, but the agenda of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it, see, it was the agenda of the Gnostics that led them down this road of, of, of being hedonists. You know, I want to enjoy these pleasures, and so that's the way I'm going to look at Scripture. That's the way I'm going to interpret things. And that's what led them down that road is their own wants and own agenda. Also, he talks about keeping yourself in God or keeping, yeah, keeping yourselves in God's love. And um, is there anything, though, that can separate us from God's love? That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Out of Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39, you can read that. Height, depth, all that. Nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us. So what does this little verse mean? Well, what does Jesus say over in John chapter 15, verse 10? He says, if you keep my commandments, you remain in my love. You see, obedience to Christ's commands keeps us in the center, in, in that sweet spot of God's love. Now, nothing can separate us from God's love, but our actions, our disobedience, our, our drifting, that can take us away from, from the benefits of being right there in the center of God's love. So that's what he encouraged his readers uh, to do for themselves. But what are they supposed to do when it comes to other people? Well, first of all, let's keep in mind that all people need to hear the truth. All people need to hear the gospel. And also remember what we said earlier that about different people maybe needing different approaches to the gospel. I think that that's what Jude is trying to get across here. Uh, to those sincere doubters, those honestly struggling with faith issues, be merciful, be compassionate, be patient with those people. To those who maybe are only one step away from heresy, man, sweep in, do what you can to save them from going down that road. But to others, whether they're possibly unbelievers or heretics in the church, whatever, you still have to show mercy. That, that, that's overall is, is being merciful. But also be very fearful, very careful, loving the sinner but hating the sin. Don't get so close to the person in the situation that you become affected by their sinfulness. And you probably have known of examples where that's happened. Well, as we conclude here, Luke chapter 10, verse 27 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Jesus just doesn't say, love God with your heart and soul. The Christian faith is more than feelings. Even though it includes feelings, it's more than that. It's more than that warm, good feeling. It also includes our in intellect as well. And so we need to grow in our intellect of Scripture. So when people come to us with questions, like 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And the last little bit of that verse says, But do this with gentleness and respect. That's that mercy. That's that compassion, patience. Standing and yelling in people's faces and uh, standing on the street corner and, and yelling, to me, doesn't really accomplish anything. Let's do this. Let's build relationships and do this with gentleness and respect. Let's use that intellect to show others the truth. And that's the point of this week's, uh, this week's lesson. Next week, we're going to be looking at a basic question concerning defending the, the faith. And that is just the basic question, is there even a God? We'll be looking at two passages out of the Old Testament book of Psalms. So pray for your class this week that they will be thankful in all situations and um, that they'll be better students, uh, not just in your class, but students of the Word, where they'll be able to defend their faith even better than they do now. Thanks, guys. <laughs>